Uh, Susan, thank you very much. I did hear the beginning of your your introduction, and that's very kind of you. And was uh, I think the first Tisco I did with um, back when it was Tisco was with Mary Thorne, who invited me. I think it was 2012, maybe. Yeah, 2012 would make sense, right? Um, and uh, it was really, really cool. Um, or yeah, maybe shortly after that. And then uh, I just started hang, coming down and hanging out and, and talking. So uh, the thing I thought with this uh, talk, which I kind of put together a bunch of different stuff because when I asked Susan, like, what, what should we talk about? I mean, hey, that's cool. We can do a meetup. She's like, well, there's this and then there's this and then we should talk about early performance testing. We should, I'm like, okay, so we're just gonna do like a rapid fire Q and A. And then I got to thinking about it, which is, there's actually a lot to be talked about when I come like multiple years, come down there and like given a class or teach a workshop on continuous performance engineering, front end performance uh, testing integrated with automation, um, DevOps, whatever it is. You know that like you see someone and they give a workshop and then like, well, I took their workshop, but you took it back in 2012 or I took it in 2014 or something. Well, I, I sort of, I've delivered that same workshop, you know, maybe 10, 15 times, depending on who wants to do it or if it's a one-off kind of thing. But I'm always getting feedback and always getting questions, uh, like after the presumptions and the experience went into an older topic, well, the stuff just gets refreshed, you know, as you like, you know, like what, what, what kind of questions have I gotten over the years for these different topics? So I thought it would be really interesting to kind of go through a bunch of these items and give just kind of an introduction to it and then kind of share some of the stories from people I've met and the questions I've got um, along the way. Uh, so if you're ready, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I'm gonna share, I, I hope this is, there we go, optimize screen share for video clip. There we go. All right, you guys are seeing that? I see it. That's a lovely little thing. Um, and again, feel free to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop between there are kind of sections through here so we can go through and look at that so welcome to um this amalgamate talk of really exciting uh updates uh on the different subjects that i've got um i put in some sexy automation just because everyone should have sexy automation uh perfites answers all of your performance questions of course maybe not all of your questions uh but some of your questions or many of these questions um my name is mark uh, I call myself a performacologist on LinkedIn because they don't force you to have any specific title on LinkedIn, so you can call yourself whatever you want. Um, and if you're not listening to the Perk Fights podcast, well, you probably have good reasons. We've been around a long time, and you may have listened to all everything that we have to say. Uh, but we do have some new things. We have a Perk Fights Espanol. Uh, Leandro I actually met uh, in North Carolina at the Tisco event two years ago, which was really cool. Um, and he started uh, some YouTube video stuff as well with us. Uh, I actually have a new format for Perf Bytes that's coming out um, next month in July. Uh, and we have a couple other things in the, that are cooking uh, in the, for the rest of the year, which is kind of exciting. So tune into Perf Bytes, you can subscribe. Uh, we do a QA and a and that kind of stuff as well. So Perf Bytes answers your performance questions today. What we're gonna do, we're gonna give, uh, we, basically we give talks and workshops here and there on performance stuff. Uh, people ask us questions and give us all sorts of feedback, and now I'm going to share some of that information with you because isn't that nice? I think that's really nice. Um, of course, then you will ask more questions from this presentation, and then I'll include those in our next iteration, which means we've created a paradox that the universe will cease to exist. It's not actually true. Uh, if we're still here, um, these are the topics that came from talking with Susan and other folks that uh, might have joined. I want to take a look at this. Um, I've given uh, a workshop at Tisco on continuous performance, continuous delivery and performance. Um, the microservices and performance in elasticity. So specifically talking about microservices and some of the experiences I've had with that. There's this new thing called observability, um, which I'm kind of picking up the jargon, but trying to decipher, you know, how to help people and, and answer some questions there. Um, I recently gave an SDP uh, webinar on artificial intelligence and performance and where you might find that. So some of these you can find pre-existing slides or recordings and stuff out there, uh, but these are an updates from it. Another area that I've been asked recently about is performance risks, uh, like static analysis for performance. So risks and vulnerabilities and threat detection. 
around performance and could you, it's basically, could you do all the things we do with a GRC in security, but apply them to performance? And I'm like, oh, well, that's, that's an interesting idea. Um, Pre-release performance testing, of course, Susan said, I really need to talk about testing pre-release and early performance. So we'll go into that quite a bit, but I have some new ideas uh, to share with that. And then I've recently gave, uh, I have been doing a lot of work in deciphering the capabilities and in, in client side web performance on the front end. So web perf, which is now entering its maybe 15th year or so, 16, 14th or 15th year worth of, of the web getting fat and ugly. Um, isn't that nice? Um, so let's dive in. Continuous delivery performance, where I usually put a picture of the continuous uh, uh, sugar fountain in a, in a Krispy Kreme, continuous donuts. Um, this is the main image that I use when I describe continuous performance. And that is, as we traditionally develop software, even if we're doing it in fancy new automated ways with, with all sorts of uh, continuous integration and development, all sorts of deployment and automated deployment tools uh, along the way. Basically, there's the idea that we're writing code and pushing it to production, and it has to do a bunch of stuff along the way. And I call that the promotional flow. And then there's another coming back, so the feedback flow. So what happened in production? Oh, I don't know. You should look at the logging, look at the monitoring, look at the whatever, and let's go back to development and see if we need to change or we need to fix anything. Um, oh, what happened in the performance test? okay, well, we need to change and fix some things. So there's the forward flow, and then there's the feedback flow. And for the most part, that's the model that I still use to, to teach the idea of continuous performance. Uh, if not, some people actually just took this slide and they put their environment names in there and said, woohoo, we're going continuous. Um, the recommendation generally, uh, just to give a recap, is that continuous integration is usually from between development and test in our case, development and performance tests. And of course, then from performance test or your test environment into production, if we're in line, meaning your performance testing happens on every check-in or on every other check-in, we'll talk about that. So a lot of the challenges are, I may take a release but not push it to production. How do I do that? Uh, and how do I, do I have to do that? Give me some options. Um, but those are the three kinds of ideas um, that kind of go together, start with development, then grow that piece in there. So I got a lot of questions um, from, from the community down there about, you know, hey, we tried some of these ideas, Mark, didn't quite work out. Two of the things, just as feedback right off the top, um, one was that we, you know, these ideas were ahead of, it, ahead of their time compared to the organizations that they were working for. So um, the, uh, the, let me think about this a second. Hang on one second. Yeah, cool. Um, built in. Okay, we're good. Yeah, I was just double checking. The, um, the one we were ahead of our time. So we were ready to do all kinds of hook up small little tests on the pipeline and give feedback, but the pipeline wasn't completely built. So that was really kind of the first question that popped out that I wanted to cover. What if our pipeline isn't actually completed or really exists? So I went to several customers or talked to different folks that are like, we say we're a DevOps shop, we say we're in this continuous delivery, but really we're still, we're still manually waiting and pushing things manually and we're, it's really not, you know, push the button and goes all the way through, uh, which is more the norm that I can say than not. Um, so if I think about prior to continuous delivery, prior to the way we built software, you would manually deploy and push code into separate environments, right? So a separate test environment, a separate load test environment, potentially, maybe even pre-production. Um, and that particular release is out of sync from the flow of code, but it's the best release to run load tests on because the most things are working, the features were most risked, uh, the changes that are most risky, those are the things we want to test. So we would take a release that has the items in it that we're definitely most concerned about for doing larger scale load tests and doing performance analysis. So if we, prior to continuous, so prior to 2005, everyone had like a separate load test lab, and then we start consolidating and, and putting stuff together and running in the cloud, and then, wow, okay, now I don't have a totally separate environment. 
you can run what I call a standalone pipeline where you could either use Jenkins. I use Rundeck personally, but uh, I've given the demos to you guys on that. Uh, but you can have your own sort of 24 hour continuously running performance cycle that isn't technically hooked up to the pipeline. So you can receive a build if you choose. And it's just that the automation of that, you don't have an upstream pipeline, a, a step in Jenkins or a step in the logic that says I'm waiting for a performance test result. It's more like asynchronously handing off, here's your release, but it'll take that release and it'll keep running that test 24 seven. This is in fact how I'm working currently. And I have uh, you know, a set of about seven different scenarios across three or four main applications, I say application areas, uh, collection of scripts. So we don't have huge number of assets to manage, but it, it'll run, if I don't push a new release, it'll, the next day, it'll repeat that same suite of tests and I can compare day over day, even if it doesn't run. So you can have sort of a separate environment that just runs and runs and runs 24 seven. The two things to think about this are one, if I wanna go push a re release into that environment, do I support zero downtime? So can I test zero downtime, failover, et cetera, seamless pushing in production? That's a great place to learn and test that. In fact, I spent six months of my life just helping an infra team do zero downtime pushes for database and app. So we use this continuous model, meaning the load is continuously running in this environment. We, have, we finally choose an, a, a, a build to push and we test zero, time, zero downtime to push it in there. Um, the other thing uh, to consider is maybe I don't support zero downtime. So my deployment automation or my deployment steps should be, how do I stop the load and sort of cleanly reset the environment, push the new release in, and are there some pre-test steps? Are there some setup steps that I should also automate before we get back into running continuously? So those are the two considerations when you sort of are running disconnected from the pipeline, but still continuously running performance. Um, still the benefit of co continuous performance testing is that you are trending the results from one build, one release to the next in kind of a simple way. The simplest way I do it is just repeat the runs and then gather all of the metrics in a time series database. So you can, you can even look at a whole month's worth of results. Um, hey, Mark, so there's a couple of questions that are popping up in chat that maybe um, are timely yeah. to some of what you're saying. Uh, the circles on your slides, uh, how long would you say each of those cycles is? I, it, obviously, a good uh, context-based person, I would say it depends. Um, in some cases, you could have, this could represent one work stream for a component. Uh, in, if you're in a... Uh, uh, separate environment, each flow could represent, you know, the account object or the account lookup component or something like that. And it sort of has its own release trajectory. So every time one gets built in development at each step along the flow, hey, we're going to do fire up a small uh, VM with a small amount of test data and just do a 10 thread little test just to see if anything looks weird at very small scale. Then if that passes and looks green, we go to the next step in the pipeline. So it can be a small single component. And then imagine you have, you know, 40 different components, work streams, all sort of running in, in parallel, different cadences, but in parallel, headed towards a production environment. And you may decide, hey, we're going to take uh, every Friday, we sort of take the latest and greatest from every work stream. Make sure it's in one environment, we run an integrated test where everything runs together. And that's something, again, you would sort of do out of, off the pipeline, but in a larger environment. So um, I've seen in, uh, flows like this in the old days, a single flow, something makes it out of the development, maybe in the first three, four days of a sprint, and we'll have a mid sprint load test, uh, maybe on that Friday, Thursday or Friday. Um, the performance testing practice could take that. We would run some things over the weekend or on Friday and Monday, and then we'd give some feedback. If everything actually ran really well, even on the mid sprint, we might not push that production, but we could. If we had green results in performance, we'd give a thumbs up to a build if they had to push it. Then usually like another week would go by, 
Uh, and so in a two, in a sprint, two week sprint cycle, we would actually go development to performance to development to performance at least one, at least once on each week. And then by the end of that sprint, we'd be able to push something. I've seen do it on a monthly basis where the mid test, it finally gets to performance testing practice on that midweek of a, of a three or four week month, uh, the way you analyze that. Uh, and then you would do another cycle to confirm that, yep, we, if we found anything, we fixed it before we pushed it. Um, so I've seen the, small scale stuff that where people will do this even smaller, where they'll do all of this in one day if it's highly automated. Well, sure. Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Um, to, in ideal worlds, I know that test environments and dev environments, 100% mass production, but they, that's not real world. How do you account for the differences between it? Like, do you worry about uh, load balancing or uh, you know, thread pools? Or are there any other limitations between the, these different environments that you uh, have to account for? Actually, I'm going to talk about that later in the, okay. in the presentation you. in the early performance testing part, which is a great question. I am not, for some reason, I am not seeing the QA thing. Where am I? In the bottom middle, there's a button that says chat, and it looks like a little cartoon bubble. It doesn't like. On the. It doesn't like. It doesn't like it when I'm. When I'm presenting, I can't see. It. That's why. Ah, uh, could be. Could I'll be. See, maybe. Oh, there. I'll hit chat. Zoom. So I'm in chat. Oh, look at that. There we go. You got I'll this zoom. now. All right. Cool. Oh, I got it. All right. All right. All right. So I got the chat going on the side, which is totally fine. Um, do I use load balancing in my performance test generally? Um, if that is critical to the success in production, I absolutely would. Um, if it is sort of a, this thing can scale on a single node and we're just making some assumptions, maybe it'll be load balanced, maybe it won't, then maybe I wouldn't do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if it's critical, my current system runs six, six servers on one of the main components that we run. And of those six servers, it's always load balanced. So um, I have to say nearly 20 years ago, maybe, load balancing was like this brand new idea, sticky sessions, persistence, uh, you know, having a physical switch that would do the load balancing and having enough memory and enough speed to actually maintain a table for persistence. I mean, we were really, we were stressing those components. I haven't blown up a physical load balancer in a very, very long time. Um, but, and, you know, hitting hundreds of nodes in, in distribution. So it's something that doesn't often, recently doesn't often pop up to the top of the screen. On that. We'll talk a little bit about environment scale as I get through the next one. Um, but good, good, really good question. Um, one of the other questions I get on CIT, if our tools are not, the same in development uh, or prod, can I still do all this kind of work? And the concern that this person had was, if I have developers testing with, you know, Gatling or JMeter, and I have uh, a load runner or Neo load and a bigger load testing tool in load test, and then I have other synthetic tools running in production with other monitoring, well, I, I'm having all these different disparate tools, but I have one flow of pipeline. How do I compare all these results and how do I get everything to work? And it's a pain uh, to do it. Um, the one thing, one, you should definitely expect some arguments. So if you say, my tool says X, and then you talk to the developer and the developer will be like, well, my tool says Y. And then you talk to the person in production, they're like, well, my tool says Z. Now you've got X, Y, and Z. But it may be saying the same result, it just shows it slightly differently. Um, so one of the things you can do is try to calibrate if they're between the tools. Well, this tool always shows X and that's kind of run over run. We sort of notice that this always shows 10% slower or 10% faster or profile something differently and just get used to it. With something we do normally as humans is, yeah, that graph always looks a little bit there. If on Thursday that graph was off the charts, you'd be like, whoa, wait a minute, that's not the tool. That's got to be something else. Um, so you get, you can calibrate it in your mind uh, with your own memory, but then if you can pull the results out and just compare response times, uh, with a, you know, min max average 90th percentile, you know, what's your, uh, you know, what's, what's the, what's the standard deviation across that and compare them, 
then get used to what that margin of error would be between the tools. Um, I also see people trying to compare, obviously, development with almost no load to production synthetic monitoring with tons of load or at different times of the day. So they're like, well, this says it was X. If you've seen some of the, the work patterns, you're like, oh, yeah, well, that was 8 o'clock at night. There's no one on the system. Or our peak is actually starting, you know, in the first thing in the morning and then it goes up. So the cadence or the periodicity of that load or workload throughout the day Make sure you're comparing apples to apples. So I, I know folks that are like, if I'm in development, I have, you know, maybe two or you know, 10 transactions per second running in development for a small test. So I just find a window in production that has similar throughput, and then I compare the two, even if they're in different tools, um, which is an interesting idea, I thought. Um, but try to calibrate. Something we do naturally as humans is to calibrate uh, that output um, when we get used to different tools. Um, let's see here keep things going. Uh, the other one, our target systems. This is a big thing I didn't really cover much in the workshop was the ephemeral systems that kind of give casual stuff. And I currently uh, run ephemeral load testing um, performance systems. So the target systems are ephemeral, but my test tool is not. Um, and one of those things is like I've got, if you're not full on in the cloud, even with cloud-based load testing, like uh, well, I don't know, Flood, or you've got the HP or Microfocus has one, um, Tricent, yeah, Flood has one, NeoLoad has one. They're sort of still sort of a permanent load tool exists and is running and can be used, and it doesn't go away. But the system under test is ephemeral. And so one of the things that you have to get, I have to check in my scripts and check in my test assets. So when I'm deploying... I don't deploy the entire tool, I just deploy the test assets to the tool, and that's a different kind of thing. Uh, and like some of the cloud-based vendors have an API you can just upload, um, so you're, you're looking at that. If you're running on-premise, I actually containerized a few of my own tools, so it's got JMeter in it, monitoring in it uh, for a load generator. So my load generators are ephemeral, they're in a Docker container. So if I need more load, I don't really do them elastically, but I can deploy load generators pretty easily. They, the first thing they do, they wake up, phone home. Can I get to the controller and you know, start doing my thing? The controller is fairly permanent. It's, uh, it's the instance that I configure and it just uses standard um, RPC, SSH, uh, secure shell and secure copy um, uh, to, to make its communication, which is pretty cool. Um, the ephemeral environments, depending on where they get employed, some of the folks I talked to were, well, you know, sometimes we run, we don't, we never know where it's going to get fired up. If it's ephemeral, it might get fired up on a different server. And, and since we're in dev and test, we have like, we get the leftovers, you know, we get the, oh, well, that server used to be in production, but we gave it to test. And that still happens in the world. Um, even in the cloud, you can, you know, well, we used to fire you up on this tier. But that same tier now changed because they retired old hardware and whatever. And so all of a sudden, uh, you've been running for three months and all of a sudden, oop, your performance changes. And no, you actually just have faster hardware, even in the cloud. Oh, yeah, well, they retired such and such VM for another one. So when you're trending across those test runs, you might want to always do a very simple, like something that doesn't really hammer the load test, but just sort of make some calls, uh, ping would be one for network, obviously. You could do a small kind of a test that does a hello world or a health check. One of my apps has, uh, a lot of my apps have a health check page on the standard URL. So I just do like 10 transactions per second to the health check page, just to see if anything else changed on that machine. Um, usually the IO infrastructure is the same. So that's one thing I do as sort of a, a pre-test benchmark so I can compare that sort of benign page or that simple page. Um, and then of course, if your systems end up being ephemeral from an infrastructure standpoint too, you could have weird dynamic host names or test data, like the minute you fire up a new instance, your test data is now invalid, I've seen that as well. So that was a good question. The other one, uh, the last question on this, the builds are coming so fast we never complete a test. Yeah, that's, uh, these guys, usually their tests were too big. So they were taking a standard load test that runs for one to two hours, but when a developer would check something in, they're waiting for performance tests for one to two hours and result. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. So 
better to have lots of little load tests that are more specific to components um, or uh, think about them as sort of that in between a unit test and a full end-to-end -end test, something that's of a medium size. Um, and again, a developer doesn't necessarily want to know full-blown production performance testing. That's not your customer. Your customer infrastructure guys or production guys, that's probably, they want the big load test results. So a developer just wants to know, did I block anything on itself? Did I make any egregious single-threaded mistakes uh, where all of a sudden it used to do you know, used to run great, now it only runs one thing at a time. Um, you might do some other logging analysis that says, well, we, we used to make one call and it was one database call, and then on Thursday, one call equals a thousand database calls. What did you do in that logic? That's, you know, a thousand database calls just throws up a red flag. So think about lots of small tests um, on the pipeline. You might still do that big load test once or twice a month. Maybe that in the middle of a sprint or a middle of an iteration, hey, that Friday, we're gonna kind of take the latest and greatest and do a big load test, and that may make sense to do that. Um, so that's, the, the builds are coming so fast. The other thing I'll say is be choosy. Some people, you may, you, in Jenkins, one of the places uh, I advise, they just have a flag, and if there's acceptance criteria for performance, they have to, they check that box when it goes through. So the pipeline knows to put a conditional on the logic. So it'll say, yeah, I'm gonna go run, I'm gonna go run a performance test or I'm not gonna run a performance test. And those are kind of the questions that came in around performance of CI. Do you guys have any more questions on continue? How many of you are doing continuous stuff? So at my place, we do um, uh, continuous integration, but we're not doing continuous deployments. Uh, I, I've had some friction, you know, trying to get that last sign off like to be rolled back to be fully automated. Yeah. Um, I, I, I keep pressing the point because I personally agree with it, but I also think that it helps to uh, elevate the discussion of what is it that makes you afraid so that you won't let it go through automatically. And then yeah. can we test for that? Can we make that an automated thing so that someone can't accidentally not do it later? Sure. Yeah, yeah. It makes you, uh, it drives the discussion of, what decisions are we actually making and do we need to make them? Are we making them at the right time? The other thing I always press for folks are, have you collected enough data to make a good decision? You might have a decision you're making, but you don't have all the best data. So you just kind of go on anecdote or gut feelings or intuition, nothing wrong with that. A lot of people are very successful with that. Um, and then you find out later that the data, well, oh, the data shows that we should have never done that push. <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good point, John, as well. Um, you guys ready to move on? Microservices. We talked a little bit about elasticity for load generators, uh, but I, this is just one that I wanted to jump right in and throw some questions out to you guys or, that I had received. One, uh, testing in a big microservices environment, separate clusters for each microservice, how should I test them independently? And these, this was in a safe model where we're looking at maybe 60 to 70 work streams on a very large kind of CRM-ish type of application. Um, and none of the, they had gotten these great load runner guys or JMeter guys to do put, put together the performance team and they were sort of roaming out on these different work streams. So they were kind of the consultants and advising testers and developers on the teams to do good performance testing. None of them on that particular project had been into stubbing service virtualization. Uh, I turned them on to this MB test, but Parasoft, uh, Microfocus, obviously, CA, ITKO, the old uh, ITKO stuff. Service virtualization where you can stub out stuff, and that raised a huge flag for people who builds the virtual services, who builds them out, and can we automate the building of them? Um, so if my dependency service changes, do I have to change to match that release? So the service virtualization main maintenance, creation and maintenance, almost became more overwhelming to them than just writing load test scripts for a component. Because they were microservices, the components were kind of CRUD-based objects, uh, and they string them together, but it was fairly good microservices, independent architecture. But they, they were overwhelmed. They were like, we don't know how to build those. I'm like, it's like, it's a reverse virtual user. You're recording protocols and figuring out how to respond. So one of the tips I gave them uh, around performance one was 
can you get the developer team of the dependency when they're writing their code, can they also be accountable for developing the virtual version? So they, they have a flag you can turn on or turn off and, oh, hey, we're running with you virtualized. And when you're ready, push your code and we flip the flag. Now we're testing both components or three components or eight components together. Um, that didn't go over very well because it's extra work and developers don't like extra work, which is fine. Um, but then when we, they were really good at sort of non-functional requirements, response time requirements. So I said, let's go back and look at what we think from production, what is the incoming request rate and the egress rate. So if we're having, uh, we're, we're at a chain of dependency, if something comes in at 100 transactions per second, but really only 14% of those calls result in some dependent call or something out the back end of the service, can we get an idea as to what, using Little's Law, what does that box look like? Input, output, and what's the egress rate? And what do I have to reply with at that rate? But what other dependencies am I generating load on if I someone chained them together? Uh, so that was an interesting to think about volume and rate. The response time uh, in a microservices model, most of this was all web services. So we're looking at maybe 250, 200 milliseconds or less on any call. Um, but in a large organization that they would deploy this, like with a multinational giant corporation, CRM-ish, um, and they were doing supply chain stuff, they could have upwards of four or 500 people banging away on the system. Um, the other thing I would say that helped people in this, when they had the separate clusters, they would go to publish test results and they were used to, here's my big, big performance test result, you're approved for this, we need X amount of CPU. They were kind of classic, here's my report from Load Runner kind of test. Uh, results. And so I'm like, you guys, you really only tested a, a small scope of the greater microservices web, the, the, the mesh of, of services that you have. So make sure when they were publishing the results, put a little safety language that says, for this many calls coming in to this component, calling this component and that component at the following egress rate, here's what we observed on the VMs or on the machine scoped to that component or service. And so that helped a little bit as well. Um, but that's, again, something I didn't, I didn't exactly cover uh, in, in my talk about this. Um, could you another, yeah, go ahead. Do, could you define what you mean by separate clusters? You mean like separate load balancers or separate areas that each microservice is called? Because I was at a workplace uh -huh. where we had a whole bunch of microservices, and they were described as this nice long river, and you could just dip into it and whatever microservice service was already running and yeah. it was so specific it already had the answer that it knew you were going to ask a specific question had the answer right there ready and waiting yeah very similar to but what does clusters mean yeah so the separate clusters could be grouped two different things quite physically a cluster meaning an elastic cluster uh so if you have this uh i'm doing performance testing in test or dev that's on the next page uh, they are actually testing small groups. So on a work stream, they, maybe they had of actual services, maybe anywhere from 10 to 20 kinds of groupings, logical groupings of functionality. Um, there may be some domain interdependency. Uh, they were fairly good about breaking the model. This large app was a monolith. So, you know, when people were breaking down the monolith, they still keep, like, here's all the account functions that we're still kind of trying to get them to be independent. Uh, from one another in terms of actual logic. So yeah, clusters in terms of logical functionality and groupings and architecture, but quite physically, these guys were testing in their test environments ephemerally, they're in the cloud, they would fire up, you know, again, they had, they were firing up 10, 20 servers to let this thing kind of run when they were putting it under load. And I said, you know, set, if you think in production, what you might have someone get is maybe 25 nodes, start with you know five nodes and then test five nodes 10 nodes 15 nodes in actual physical clusters or groupings load balance groups of nodes and then and then we turned off the elasticity during the test just so we could see it use the resource of five nodes then use the resource of 10 nodes and then here's the resource for 15 nodes and start doing some some projections that way um, so yeah clusters physically as well as clusters of grouping um, but for these guys, each microservice area is more microservice area. How do I test them independently? The biggest thing was service virtualization uh, and trying to keep those separate. I hope that helped answer your question, Sue. Yeah, it did. Thank you. Yeah, because 
I was like deploying these into my own little river because I wasn't using the real river. It didn't yeah. exist yet. Yeah. So you had to deploy them in a certain order and then stop them in the reverse order. Yep. Because this had to be running before this would run on top of it. Yeah. So and there were some dependencies among the microservices. Yeah. And these guys were pretty good about keeping them separated architecturally. Um, not breaking. They were, they were committed to trying to create a model that was fairly independent. Um, the other thing that's really common is my microservice isn't very micro. So I wouldn't even call it a, a small cluster. There are people that just created an ESB and relabeled it. We're microservices. And it's like, no, you're still a giant architectural blob. Um, and then the same old stuff applies um, for performance testing. I tell people, test the methods that are working and make notation that, hey, you know, there's a data dependency. So only when we have data working for X can we test that next component. Or actually, like you say, Sue, the functional dependency could be that's, that's not actually available to run. I need to stub it out. Um, so it wasn't very micro. But the problem was because they had more work streams coming at them, they, again, load testing kept getting further and further delayed to the point where, well, we've got one week, good luck, guys. And so they were in a really, really tough spot. It's a different customer uh, than that. But they, they were still trying to figure out how to break down that monolith to stuff. Um, the other thing uh, to say is that monitoring and profiling, when you're monitoring stuff, you'll say, oh, I'm taking up 15% of the CPU. Well, there are, you know, in the real world on that same host of that same configuration, are, are you on that same configuration? Are, there are 85%, maybe 80% resources available, but who's, you know, how do I generate that noise uh, and maybe consume that noise if those services aren't there or they aren't working? Um, there are a couple of utilities out there to just chew up CPU. I mean, I've also just, you can do a giant zip or you can figure out some tool and just let it run in the background on, on the server. Uh, to create noise makers, which is always kind of a fun thing to do. Um, the, oh, this is what, hang on a second. I forgot my title there. I didn't change my title on this one. Um, the production environment is elastic, but the test is not. Help. Um, so the, the one thing is you want to test without elasticity because otherwise, well, one, your load will just keep going and going. It's like, hey, look, we're, we've consumed all of uh, EC2, the entire world of Amazon, we're running 100 million transactions per second across the globe. Uh, yeah, and then you get the bill in your invoice at the end of the month. That's not good. So try to adjust your results to, to, uh, to show performance just for one instance in one node, which is really good for small early testing, and then do two instances uh, of a service on one node, or however your configuration works. Uh, I'm a big fan of testing 1x, 2x, 3x. So you can actually see sort of at three data points within a given scale. So you turn on elasticity with a max. Um, so when you run for a larger test, you may give some elasticity, but do it in groups. So in production, like I say, you may have 25 nodes that you think are probably going to run. Uh, it could be a customer, it could be your own systems. But you say, let's test with five nodes and see how that goes. Then let's test with 10 nodes. And did we get exactly twice the throughput? Oh, we didn't because there's some dependency that has a bottleneck and then off you go trying to figure out where that dependency is bottleneck. Then you do 15 nodes and let it grow elasticity to 15 nodes. But you've sort of tested in those three different tiers, 1x, 2x, 3x, five nodes, 10 nodes, 15 nodes. And you can start making some decisions of, well, sure, it scales to 15 nodes, but this particular function doesn't because it's dependent on the database and we have a bad index, a missing index or a bad database setup, something like that. Um, to limit your max elasticity so you can show, you know, one node, two node, three node, four node, or up to n nodes. Um, and once you know those numbers, someone will come along and say, well, how about 50 nodes? And you're like, great, let's go do 50 nodes. Let's buy more tools. Let's build a huge load test in the cloud. That's fun. Um, the other question that came to me after uh, a microservices performance test was, if we change one microservice, do I need to retest the whole performance of everything, which is kind of a classic, like, build a binary kind of developer thing, right? If I change one function and then I recompiled it, boy, that whole, that whole binary is now suspect. 
did I change something? And in the microservices world, you may not have that. So one thing you want to do, like I say, mapping potential dependencies, look at upstream where your service or your component is a dependency, and then look at the dependencies that yours has. If nothing's changed in tier one, upstream or downstream, but you've changed, then you may decide, hey, I'm going to test this. If you've not changed and your dependency has not changed, but something upstream has changed, then go ahead and test that. If something changes on either, either side of you, uh, if, if something changes on either side of you, then figure out where that change or the blockers to that service, hey, something changed that I know could be a blocker for me, that puts me at risk, I'm gonna change, I'm gonna go test my component just to be sure. And that's kind of the rule of thumb. If nothing on your dependency as a blocker has changed, then you might say, I'm safe, what do you got? And turn around back upstream and analyze it that way. Another way to think about it, uh, I recommend them, do you have a top 10 list of once you figure those, met, just do the mapping once because the architecture is not gonna change that much. Um, but get that top 10 list like I do for databases. These are my 10 worst entities, my largest, worst, most sensitive tables. If anything changes, I want to add a column. I want to do a bit, bit column onto something. I want to change the schema to the main orders database or something, customers database. Boy, I've got my top 10 entities, which are the heaviest hit and most sensitive to the most components. If anything changes within those top 10, I'm actually raising the flag hip where you should do a performance test. Let's get ready and spend the money because the risk is there. You could do the same thing for individual components and services. Cool. Daily maintenance events on services during services during. Uh, I, I am a member in my world. I'm a member of my infrastructure team. So I have the ability and admin rights to turn off any of those things during my performance tests. Uh, and since I have a schedule running um, during the day, I actually put in a maintenance window that says, I'm not running tests. So here's your maintenance window. And I know the guys do production from like four, about 4 a.m. They have a short window that they do some stuff, some of the late night guys. My load test environment is actually very similar to production. So I give them a window earlier in the evening before they, so they can actually push changes to me before they push them to prod. So I actually use the production environment and they can push it under load if they want to. Otherwise I don't do load, but I make friends with my, with my production teams. Just like, Hey, you know, we've invested this money. Why don't we let you guys learn some things? Uh, but definitely I don't, I don't necessarily worry about the daily maintenance stuff. Um, but, uh, but it is a concern if your virus scanner runs fires up in the middle of your test, Boy, then just show them the results. Say, hey, you, here's, uh, you know, we'll waste, waste a whole bunch of people's time and then show them at the end of the meeting. And here's where we can show you the IT department fired off the virus scan. And then someone goes, oh, that's it. We are, we are no longer running load tests between 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. You know, we're going to do other stuff. So I've seen that happen as well. I've seen entire, I was in a really huge, at PayPal, it was a really huge open space. And when the IT department would push the virus scanning and then re updates, reboot your machine, suddenly you, everyone was like this. And then all of a sudden, everyone was like that. And then within about five minutes, the whole place is getting up and, <laughs> and walking around or leaving. <laughs> like, oh, it's Wednesday at four once again. But everyone leaves early and we went and had beers. Nice. Uh, that's a real thing. Um, observability and monitoring. Profiling, debugging, tracing, logging, you name it. Um, this is a, a new thing for, uh, for some people. The hashtag A-L-L-Y is accessibility, and now I'm seeing hashtag O-L-L-Y is observability. Um, for me, I'm a little bit cynical about it at first because I'm like, we already observe all sorts of stuff. If you're in a production team, you've been doing monitoring for 25 years uh, or longer, the idea of monitoring, the observing a system while it's running, of what is the evidence? It, it includes all of those capabilities that we're already familiar with. Logging, tracing, debugging, profiling, monitoring, anything I need to get my hands on in order to keep the plate spinning. That's really what observability is. It's just that it's got this new popular terminology around it. And that's because it's new to a lot of people that have never worked in infrastructure or, or development. And with DevOps, they're 
hey, what does operate? What does what does production look like? What does a web real live site look like? So observability is also I'm seeing a lot of the threads um, for myself. Seeing a lot of the threads being, um, I'll say, uh, it's new to them where they want to do, they want to make a decision, but they're unable to observe. So let's say they're relying on lo app logging, but the developer didn't instrument the code to log something at the particular time. So do they have any generic, so they're like, I can't observe that because it's not observable. And that's more, if I'm an automated tester, I'm also thinking that's like testability. I want to automate this component, but they won't give me an ID or they won't give me hooks in order to do that testability. So is the code testable as a quality? Uh, so I think we should have hashtag T-L-L-Y, testability. Um, observability is the same way. I see a lot of the threads are like, we're not using a tool that we can x-ray glasses to look inside and actually see stuff. So it's not that those tools don't exist. Those tools exist all over the place. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the rule of thumb here, one, I don't want to like discourage people. I was on Twitter back and forth with people. I'm like, ah, this is just the same old stuff with a new name. And I was kind of cynical, but that turns some people off. Truth be told, I shouldn't be so grumpy. I'm really excited if people can, especially testers, Hey, let's, I want to learn new stuff. I'm let's do more monitoring. Let's do more tracing. Let's move more debugging. I'm like, I will show you everything I know. Uh, Cause it's really exciting and fun. And it does frustrate me when I see companies that can't make decisions because they're like, well, you didn't log that data or you're not using a tracing tool that allows us to see that data um, for whatever reason, big thing in security world. So um, I kind of answered this. A lot of the main questions uh, on the talk I gave on that was, are we already doing monitoring? Is it the same? It might be the same to you and me, but it might be a big change for other people who didn't ever have access to monitoring. So think about observability being about collaboration. Can people, are we sharing the data? That Can everyone see what's happening and make and be part of a group decision or group feedback? Because there could be other perspectives and other concepts. Someone goes, you know what? I'm looking at this, we should like go way back in the drawing board and change all this stuff. We just did this whole thing wrong now that I'm looking at how it's being used in production. Very, 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 very interesting. So think about it more as observability as a trend for collaborating around data and monitoring and results and metrics that you gather from production. Um, and uh, try to keep an open mind for new people. Um, the other classic question is their performance overhead with observability solutions. Yes, yes and no. I'll say yes. Any extra I.O., like if you put a diagnostics tool or profiler into a database, into a .NET, into Java, that profiling chews up CPU, takes up memory, and creates I.O., giant logs. So if, you're, if the profiling and everything is very synchronous, meaning it's looking at every call going on the stack, that will produce a bunch of overhead. So you'll see it in development. You'll see it in testing you're probably not going to be turning it on in production, which is where a lot of people need it. Um, now, classic older diagnostics or profiling tools have done a tremendously good job, especially on newer versions of .NET version 4.6, uh, actually anything after 3.5, as well as the newer versions of Java after Java 8 in those two worlds, plus the latest SQL and Oracle. Like you turn on a profile or a trace in SQL and Oracle, it doesn't have a margin of the overhead. So they've done a lot more efficient things within the engines to trace something and monitor that. Um, still, if you're concerned, I, I'd always advise people, you can do just a canary server, just running without any monitoring or profiling, you know, run some transactions on that compared to the whole farm of stuff that's running and say, well, you know what, they're, when I turn the monitoring on, it adds 10% CPU. Okay, let's buy, throw another node at it through some more CPU. So it's, it's easy to deal with it, but Absolutely. Anytime you're doing more, you're going to need more, uh, more stuff. Cool. Uh, Sue, you made a, a comment about data visualization, data liter literacy. Very, very true. Especially if we talk about the next uh, section about AI. Uh, where does my data set come from to do machine learning and making that visible and being literate about how does a data flow through an app? Let's talk about that next. That would be great. It's huge. Um, do we need new tools for observability? Maybe not. You could use your existing tools. 
Um, but you might be telling a story across different parts of the component. And if you have different tools, how do I pull the results together on the same timeline and tell a story? Splunk excels at this. A lot of the time series stuff, the, the, the Elasticsearch stuff does this really well, uh, where you bring a bunch of disparate data sources in together on an elapsed time and you can start telling a story. We can observe what's happening across different components. Uh, so think about that. A lot of, at the same time, older monitoring tools or solutions, a lot of times people bought a monitoring tool and just left it there and never updated it. So yeah, I get my CPU. Yeah, I get my basics monitoring. But there's a lot of new stuff as well. It might be time to take a look at what new vendors are doing uh, in the monitoring space. Uh, the two coolest things that are happening in, in observability, one, automated analysis and problem identification, which we'll talk about with AI. This kind of gets to Sue's point as well. Um, and then escalations, this is interesting as well. We have new stakeholders observing, and then I see escalations to management and executives that has performance related data in it. Before it was just like, so-and-so coded this wrong, and this is a functional bug, and, and security always got everyone's attention. But now I'm seeing like actual escalations go to the exec corner office with like a performance graph. I'm like, oh, that's, that's awesome. That's great. Good for you. Um, so that's actually oh, that's scary yeah. when it gets taken out of context. Uh, yes, uh, like anything you take out of context can be uh, very scary. But in a in a good way, Sue. Part of the idea is that if you have more people, hopefully it's not just siloed for one person's view of I think this graph means X. Since if you collaborate and more people can see that data, then you can have more people argue about what's the right way to actually make sense and understand what that data means for sure. I completely agree. Let's talk about AI. I gave a presentation for SCP about AI. Uh, and so how to identify uh, all these hype things about AI. Um, and there are tons of pitfalls. There's, there's an entire movement that is like artificial unintelligence. I mean, there's people in the computing world that are like, forget the basic Asimov's rules. We don't need AI. I've got a brain and we'll be fine. So there's some hype around AI, and I'll say a couple. One of the hype is AI will replace testers, and also anyone else. They'll replace developers, because we have code generators for automated. It'd be similar to the test is dead. So you testers have to change, because writing tests, automate, I can write 10,000 tests a second with my AI generator thing. And it's like, yeah, well, only five of them are meaningful in the human world, but you know, the other 10,000, 9,990, are, you know, 95 are completely, you know, redundant and boring, you know. So there's things we've done um, uh, to get around that. But testers would be dead. Of course, no one else would be dead. Um, so it's kind of a hollow argument. Um, can we use a, a, a artificial intelligence means machine learning to accelerate the testing process? I'm like, maybe it could tell us, um, you know, rapid test case creation, risk prioritization, maybe it could do pattern recognition and say focus on these areas and not those areas. So maybe it's time savings, but not in a way that, that you do the exact same work and it just goes faster. It's not an automated tool in that way. Uh, it'll change what work you can focus on and, and reduce risk in doing that. So um, around uh, AI for performance, now it's saying you don't have to be an expert in performance. Anyone can just use this tool. It solves all, it automatically says, I found this bottleneck. Do you want me to deploy the solution? I've been guilty of standing on stage and saying, you know, we're going to automate with artificial intelligence, all the performance diagnostics, profiling, bottleneck and problem isolation resolution. And I'm going to go get a sandwich. And truth be told, that's never been true. It probably never will be true, but that's fine. Um, really what it does is it, you, take somebody with expertise in performance or, or other areas, and they become the guide for teaching the AI or machine learning. They, we still generate questions. We still generate meaning out of it. So we're not ever going anywhere. Um, our AI tool takes the painful part away, but how exactly does it take the painful part away, right? What, and did you create any other pain? So there are biases within machine learning engines, the al algorithmic bias on, based on the data. And if you, feed it slightly different data, but your algorithm is the same and the bias isn't adjusted for in terms of how it's asking questions and what the tolerances are, you'll come up with the wrong solution. Just like my human brain. I mean, I'll, I'll like, I walked into another situation. It looks a lot like a .NET garbage collection problem, but oops, nope, it's a database issue. 
or it's a mobile slow network issue. But for all practical purposes, all of the elements I was used to looking at, I trained my art, my real intelligence on the wrong model. Um, very interesting. And uh, yeah, really good point about 1980s case tools. But they were going to solve all the world's problems, right? Um, I make a comment about hedge fund managers. That's fine. So uh, the main tools uh, claim about AI and ML. By the way, I'll ask Sue, how long am I supposed to go? I'm actually supposed to be done by now. Well, no, we usually go until 7.30. Okay. Uh, but so like if you want to get to a stopping point and then open the floor up, I have tons of questions I've sat here thought of. So Okay. So, uh, let, me, let me crank through these pretty quick. Uh, the AI stuff, there are tools that make claims around machine learning specifically for transparency. Uh, ask, does the vendor explain how AI and ML is used? They might just say, we have artificial intelligence. It's really just a conditional rules engine built in their tool. They didn't have AI. It's not artificial and it's not very intelligent. Um, scalability. So if you use the tool, does it recursively grow over time and adapt? So ask them, does this tool grow with us? Will it learn more? Can we do more with it as our needs change? Um, complexity required. If, you, if I'm going to hook up with a testing tool, uh, how complex is it? Do I need to be a statistician or a PhD quant head to figure out how to get it to work? Um, or, and do I have to know time travel? That's the other good question to ask a vendor. Um, adaptability. So uh, there's a lot to machine learning around retraining a model, retraining the tool with different data sets. How often do I need to do that? How do I keep up with the rate of change in the human world? And uh, what's the cost to retrain my model or retrain the tool to do that? And how often should I do it? And again, I mentioned a little bit around biases. They maybe gave their data set some really, really sweet data to prove in the demo. You know, the demo, it always works. It's always great. But then you get it in your own environment. So insist on doing a proof of concept with your, uh, your data and something specific to your application that you're interested in. You know, CPU disk memory network, once they figure that out, that's pretty simple in terms of problem correlation. Um, so look for those biases. Uh, and trust. So if you go to a vendor and the vendor's like, oh, it's AI, it does great, you know, just sign here. How much do you trust them, right? Do they have a track record of, hey, I, you know, do you, do you trust them? And the, a lot of this can be hype around it. Um, so the areas that artificial intelligence work well for performance, one, obviously problem identification and isolation, which is all pattern matching correlating data between stacks and saying, I see high CPU and low throughput, I must be bottlenecked somewhere. I see number of connections flatline, and then I see response time go up. Okay, I've got a limit on a connection pool. So doing the correlation between metrics and identifying problems that way, AI machine learning is perfect for that. Um, obviously a mathematical extrapolation, uh, capacity planning and trending. So if you're doing any uh, analysis for trending, uh, or forecasting algorithms. What does the future look like given the amount of data set that I can give? I have to give it a fairly consistent data set and groom that to do that. But machine learning does a nice job of, of doing those extrapolation and forecasts. Classic math, really. Um, optimization, um, I see this on a, a tool called Akama, so I looked at recently. Um, how can we get faster? How can we do more? Um, again, that's looking at patterns where we run out of some limiting resource, but we have more other resources it can make suggestions. Well, will we readjust the application to use more memory here? Mm, that much more will get, you know, squeeze uh, throughput out of a system. And that's kind of how that idea works. Um, and then risk aversion, right? So if you can actually predict when we're going to run out of a resource and then prove that the system can handle or not handle an amount of load, it's kind of cool. So those are kind of four areas that I see. The question I had is won't, won't AI just put us completely out of a job? Um, and I'm like, it might put us completely out of a job, but then who trains the AI? So now I have a different job that requires all the expertise of my previous work uh, in tech in general. Who's gonna scrub the data? All, if you talk to anyone in the machine learning world, they're all like, it's all about clean data sets. And boy, if you look at, hey, pushing the button, running the algorithm is automated, takes five seconds. But I spent two weeks grooming a data set using my brain you're still, that's still a job, right? Um, so your job definition might change, but much like manufacturing uh, and the automation era uh, over the last hundred years, I'm still building cars. I'm just building them with robots. And now I'm a robot dude. 
Um, a few people you can check out are in the AI world. Um, Jason Arbin, who's at SUBCon quite a bit, uh, he has a company called uh, Test.AI. Uh, Andrew Ng is uh, Coursera. He's an instructor. Andy, Andrew's a really nice guy. My friend Andy Grabner is an evangelist for Dynatrace, and they have some interesting AI stuff for the performance world. And then this interesting guy, uh, Moses, um, Olafenwa, Olafenwa, I think is how you say his name. Uh, Moses has this, works at, uh, with image AI, which is really some of the pattern recognition stuff that's pretty cool. Um, the uh, inclusion, Sue was saying, oh, AI conference in April. What was the, the same conclusion, Sue, that you were mentioning? Oh, what, Mr. I'm sorry, I don't know your name other than Dramji. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. David. Hey, David. <laughs> yeah, Dramji. So the point that he just made right before my statement oh, got it. Yeah, yeah. that that's what the conference came up with too. It should, it should yeah. supplement, not replace. And what yeah. was interesting is Silicon Flatirons is a, is a legal firm. Oh yeah. And so they were already seeing AI being applied, you know, with, you know, some of these legal zoom and things like that, because there's set patterns that are followed over and over again, and it oh, does yeah. reduce some of the work, but they were very, very, very reluctant to apply it to the actual legal system oh, and sure. the court system because it could, AI cannot communicate well why it made the decisions it made. Yeah. So it's hard as far as supportability of the conclusion. Yeah. And when you're dealing with someone's livelihood or someone's life, you don't want to put a machine in charge of that. Yeah, 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 very true. Um, David, you had asked about the optimization tool, Akamash. Uh, some guys out of Italy, um, Luca Forni, who's been around in the load runner world for a very long time. Luca started a company that, uh, you know, the, the six week project to figure out the ideal garbage collection settings in Java, they just, use AI to analyze that in real time. And so they're, as you put different versions of your application out and the object size and object th uh, throughput rate changes, uh, yeah, Akamas.io, yeah, it's really cool. But it'll, it'll actually real time make suggestions back to the GC uh, settings, um, which is kind of cool. So they just automated that. Um, so to wrap it up, uh, two last sections. Um, one, I gave, uh, I was at a security conference of all places in the non-functional world. And I ended up doing a lightning talk on the side around performance risks and vulnerabilities because security and performance are non-functional uh, uh, siblings. And so I have always thought, you know, static performance analysis would be a really cool thing. So I started talking about it. Um, obviously, there are some predetermined poor patterns. If you've ever been in a team of developers where there's some lead developer that just argues, no, your code reviews are just pointing and slamming hands or they're being aggressive or whatever. Or you're in a totally fun place. It's like, ah, you know, you get to wear the dunce cap for the day. That's fun. Um, or if you code something beautiful with no, the bad, no, no bad patterns, then they take you out to lunch. It's great. Um, but keep in mind with static analysis, every app is different and every developer is different. So there are more than one way to write code. There's more than one way to get something processed. Uh, and there are pros and cons depending on each. So static performance analysis looks for indications. It doesn't look for absolute, you know, that is a bad line of code. Unless you blacklist something and you would like you would in the uh, block list something uh, or uh, prevent it. The idea being um, uh, like in security, you can block something in the firewall. Well, I should be able to block. Nobody can use function X because it's known horrible. Every time we use it, it's terrible. Don't use it. So there's some static performance analysis stuff that could be very absolute. I think most of it is relative, meaning I find something here that is an indication of a bad pattern for N plus one retrieval and multiple round trips. That's not good. Here's something that's a bad rendering. Front end performance analysis uh, we'll talk about next. Um, the main static performance analysis is configuration and looking at configuration change over the environments, uh, which is really interesting. So configuration for static performance analysis, compare all the configurations in all the environments and hey, you screwed up the connection pool settings here, connection string, you screwed up number of thread count over here, over there, max threads, min threads, that kind of stuff. 
So configuration is often the culprit. Um, also, if I do static analysis and development, I may find something that looks like the tip of an iceberg, but it's an iceberg that no one's ever going to hit in the middle of the night. So you may identify something in static analysis. There's a lot of argument as to whether or not it'll ever be exploited. In the security world, since the corner office and CEOs got involved, it's every security vulnerability is bad, so just cross it all off the list. Performance is slightly different. You'll have more, um, you have more, um, more argument about it. So the two main questions that came out: um, Can we seriously identify performance risk before we build? Was the big question. So one, you can definitely look for poor performance coding patterns. Uh, as I said before, they're they're not absolute usually. Uh, I would focus on the configuration and then start documenting like we do normally in our brains. Hey, here's the don't do this list. You know, here's, here's things in our patterns that we do as a team. Just if we bring someone new in the team, I'm going to share it. Here's the don't do list. And if you absolutely have to violate one of the 10, seven deadly sins of poor performance, you know, let's talk about it because there may be no other way that you can get it done. Uh, and then we'll find ways around it. Um, the risk of performance versus security failure was the other good question that came from that uh, talk. One, uh, this and this came right out of my head uh, was just security is a bigger financial risk to the business, whereas performance is a bigger technical risk to, to the business. And I would say the technical risk around performance is an internal cost because it's rework, it's technical debt, it's re-architecture, it's this didn't work and now we need to shuffle a whole bunch of stuff to move forward. With security risk, everything might be doing well, but you get exploited and there's legal consequences, compliance consequences and cost, but the ship is still running. The, the, the engine is still running and you're still going forward if you're lucky. Uh, and you can, you know, you can figure out a way financially to deal with that risk. But I, I would say performance compared to security, performance is a bigger technical risk uh, for doing that. Um, all right, we're, I'm going to bring it home here. Uh, you remember this lovely slide that I showed you guys before with the lovely circles? Um, for early performance testing, uh, the old performance tester says, as usual, performance testing is always left until the end of the project. The new performance engineer says, why not learn as soon as we can? And I've been talking about this kind of the whole way. Uh, but just to give an idea, early performance testing efforts are uh, working around unstable components using virtualizations, uh, stubbing. Results are usually preliminary, meaning they just tell us an indication that, oh, 10 threads ran pretty good, ran the same as last time, we're looking good, or it's not really conclusive of what's running in production. Um, it's very limited availability for lab resources if you're in shared infrastructure. I can't run my load test the same way you run your load test at the same time. Um, and some of the ideas around early performance testing is I'm going to take that big old late model performance testing and I'm just going to shrink it down, make it specific and run it shorter and then run it more frequently. And that is the basic idea for early performance testing. So you scope your test down to components or functions, parts of a business transaction, so parts of the steps of a business transaction. You might do specific queries or methods, a specific API call. Um, and then also limited data ranges, where in production you maybe scan a billion rows, maybe you're only scanning a thousand rows in a smaller environment. Um, and, uh, and the idea that you may test a single user behavior in a use case by itself, not in a concurrent integrated large scale load test. So those are some of the, the things you adapt to the test scope uh, in order to start doing earlier performance testing. Um, the process may change. So testing before an, a, an official release, that can be politically concerning. If I like to show up in the release meeting and say, we're well, performance is a failure, we cannot release. But you're releasing every hour or you're releasing every week. If, you, if you're in that fast, rapid environment, that language and that thinking doesn't really apply like the old days with late model performance testing. Um, scripts and tests uh, are really they used to be before the hard requirements, meaning I need a test that runs 10 transactions per second. I don't really know what the requirement is in production. How fast should it go? I don't know. How many users? I don't really care. I'm not really testing in prod. I just want to test 10 threads, 10 transactions per second every time someone checks in and just compare day over day to see if something screws up. 
Um, so you're testing to facilitate the discussion about requirements because nobody ever writes down, I need requirement X or target X or you know, test objectives don't write themselves. So usually by doing early performance testing, you're generating the impetus for a wonderful conversation with the technical product owner. Hey, let's talk about performance for the first time ever in your life. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, you have design. Yeah, go ahead. Do you find it makes a difference uh, in the um, the, light, the stages of development? So that like uh, the first version, the 1.0 versus you know 8.0 version of the of the service that the the, the maturity of the, the system that you're testing, it, it, you can't really do a whole lot of effective early performance testing because by the time you get the thing done, it's going to be a different beast. Um, it, depending on the speed, yes. So how, how often is, are you going to get to version eight if that's over the course of eight weeks? Boy, am I better off uh, if I do a, invest a bunch of time in running a test, I only have certain people's attention to make a change and get it in by version one. If it's still in a longer monthly iteration and really version eight is eight months away, then I think you, you have the ability to start testing early when, you know, stuff that's not going to be built for three, four months, the argument works better. We well, aren't going to build that for three, four months. So I'm going to build a, a virtualized version of that dependency or that method and still get some information uh, up and early. Um, so yeah, the, in terms of getting started, if you come in the middle of something and you don't have all of the previous data to compare to, uh, for same day sort of a B comparison for tests, um, that's then then that's hard to like start up in the middle of something because people are so used to you know just having the old the old big load test at the end of the whatever and they don't take action so if you start doing early performance testing but really everyone says hey we have a hardening sprint once a quarter that's when we take care of that so you may find a bunch of bugs but then nobody's prepped to actually fix anything. So you try to figure out when people will take action based on a performance bug. Of course, when they say that, every other day, someone from production calls up and says, hey, this doesn't work, and that doesn't work, and this doesn't work, and that doesn't work. They're fixing performance bugs in production every day. So it's like, guys, stop doing that in production. Do it in the load test environment. That might be an idea. Um, the other thing is, since, since you don't sort of have the hard and fast gatekeeping role of stopping a release as much, you get to think of yourself more of a, as an influencer. Um, this is something that Sue had asked me, the, uh, Susan had asked me about test environments and we've mentioned before. The test environment is definitely gonna change. So testing in small and I'll say very small scale. So that's small, like one thread, one user, two users, 10 users uh, with very small data sets. Maybe it's just a single slice of the architecture. Maybe there's just four or five chains of components to a data source to do that. Um, it could be a non-uniform database, meaning both physically and logically, it's not actually matching production at all. Um, and then you may have a, a, a set of overlapping or shared services or virtual services, where if you try to run concurrent load tests on these little itty bitty components, well, they're kind of blocking one another. So you get to orchestrate when these little tests start to run, figure out how to get ephemeral as, as soon as possible to do that. But the environment is definitely going to change. A couple different approaches on that. One, everything in lower environments is the same scale. So when we test in dev or test in QA or test in load test, it's all a 25% environment. And I'll talk about that next. Um, and, and then maybe pre-release is 50%, production is 100%. So we actually have 25, 50, and 100. We could compare those three uh, over time. Um, but the test environment is smaller than prod. So uh, the four E's are my rule of thumb. Extreme extrapolation is extremely evil. Um, so we don't like extrapolation. Extremely. If you still had to do a 1X, 2X, 3X, you're probably OK. Um, Configuring, uh, like I said, an exact percent for all the components. So exactly 25% of production, that's what I test at. So if I have a 16-way in production, I have a quad core in test. And hopefully I should get 4x throughput on CPU-bound types of, of systems. If it's I.O., I have four network connections versus one network connection. I have 40 gigabit down to 10 gigabit, or I have 
uh, 10 gigabit down to two, two, one gigabit, something as close as you can get. But you try to scale the environment uniformly so you can make some guesses about this. Um, and again, even if you can't extrapolate perfectly, you're still gonna find stuff that doesn't scale that could still be a vulnerability and compare across those ones. Um, we do the testing, one question I had, we do the testing, but nobody does anything until we push, meaning we found a bunch of bugs, uh, but then we're like, did you fix this? Or we push stuff. Um, if, if you find performance bugs early and they're not getting fixed, there's people in production that are still getting punished by this, the op, you know, production DBA teams, et cetera. They're like, we still have these issues. We solved all the configuration issues, but you guys just have a bad plan. I wanna give you a better plan. You need a different query or you need an entire schema redesign because that is horrible. So try to get some power from the production team and be that conduit to say, hey, we can test this query every time, every build early to see if it changes that small scale and even this, the butterfly effect is one little change in small scale could mean a gigantic change in production, depending on the thresholds for what you're testing. Um, I think also finding champions is a good thing. So finding a few interested developers, learning about what their needs are. Like, we're really interested in this CPU or this new code or this code change or something. So, yeah. Um, the last section I have goes pretty quick, Susan. So if that's cool, I'll, I'll wrap it up. I got your chat there. Um, that university scalability, oh, exactly. I like that. Uh, client side web performance. I gave a couple of talks recently and it's a whole different community of people in UX and UI design in the web. Um, there are really 16 main rules that have been around since Steve Souders wrote stuff. You can look at these, um, on the, on the appiumhub.com tech blog, just look for, you know, 16 web performance optimization techniques. Uh, and I recently went through and did not only this is something a web designer would know, because most web designers don't know what's behind a website they, or a web service. They just, like you were saying, Sue, uh, I, I call into the microservices and I use the microservices to build my own stream of, of work. Um, and so I went through the web rendering piece and did a bunch of that. Universally, thou shall not block thy DOM. And uh, the minute that went off in my head, I'm like, you know, there's database blocking. There's people doing resource blocking on the client side. You know, I could scale up to high heavens, all the wonderful backend systems, but the same architecture, same idea is there's resources and threads blocking one another sitting in your browser on your laptop right now. And you could have the fastest backend system in the world, but you're still stuck in the front end really, really slow. Um, the main questions I get around client side web performance are, can we combine that front end load testing? with load uh, front end testing with load testing uh, is the door open for server and network load testing people to move shift left absolutely uh, so when you're running a load test you should open the browser tools remember that old GUI virtual user you could run one GUI virtual user while you're running load definitely doing something like that you can even do it manually um, and then the web perf uh, profilers you don't even need load if it doesn't scale for that one session, meaning the rendering stuff on that, you're looking for blocking. If you hit F12 in the developer tools of Chrome or any major browser, it'll, you can see this amazing amount of profiling of the rendering engine, the layout engine, the JavaScript engine itself, and where things end up blocking in that waterfall piece. So there's like, the door is wide open for us to go, you know, bring the performance knowledge and just, I'm not talking about tables and SPIDs and IO, I'm talking about, threads not rendering in parallel uh, to, to actually put a page together. Um, the other thing is a lot of people think web perf is something you do in design for UX. You should be doing some synthetic running of web performance in production, especially if you can get it across different kinds of browsers and, and across that. Um, of course, don't the UX designers and developers do all that work? Yeah, probably not, but they're not a full-time basis. They're like, oh, something looks weird, they'll look at it. But making this, automating this as a regular analysis, uh, I did a big gig at Ancestry.com and they, they automated doing front end analysis with every build in a continuous way. It's really, really cool. Um, so if you wanna go LinkedIn to some of the guys that worked at Ancestry, you can ask them, it was really cool. Uh, but yeah, there's a whole new world of, of front end client side bottlenecks to go after 
So AI can put you out of a job, but then I'll just become a web perf guru on the front end. That'd be fine. Thank you very much. I know I just I can't believe I just took up exactly an hour and a half. I mean, there's so many things that every time I, I listen to you talk, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. We should do that. We should do that. We should talk you and so Sue, you have to do all of these things. No. <laughs> Anyway, uh, more questions if you have them. I didn't see the question panel. I just have the chat here, which has been fun. Anybody have questions? I know we've gotten up to time and I don't want to keep Any live up. questions? Yeah, no, I, I just, answered all your questions. I, I, I had a couple. Um, so one question that I had is about, like you were talking about the uh, length of time that the performance tests run. And um, for myself, I, I like to think of unit testing and, you know, all of this like test uh, world is mainly about one thing and then it's about reducing risk. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, I actually have found for myself that reducing risk starts with trying to figure out like what gets done the most and then trying to push the things that are a good fit to what gets done the most to happen then. And so sure. like if the, the unit tests are expensive, then they won't get run very often by the developer. Yeah. And you won't want to hook them to the tests or like the builds because like nobody wants to wait that long and you know, all yep. of that stuff. So I, we, we work to try to have like sub 10 minute builds everywhere that we can. And so- In, um, Including whatever tests you would need to do synchronously, right? Right, including the te including the tests and yeah. and and so along the, the the veins or in the spirit of that, um, I don't know what you found at your place to work, but um, have you found that like in some cases instead of being comprehensive about testing, but but like picking one or two performance tests and then pushing those down and using them as some sort of representation of this is likely you know the smoke signal that will tell you that your performance is off later, like you know, as, a, as an aggregate uh, yeah. can be a good fit. Yeah, those are a good fit. A, a couple of things, John. One is um, that we have, for lack of a better term, the shit list, uh, which are things that have actually happened in production and damaged the company or a customer. And then coming up in the, I won't say post-mortem, but in our, in our uh, reflection on what happened, one of the things we'll put in place is it's the, the target scenario. It's the, you know, sneaker shop scenario. And those ones, because they, because people felt pain, they get some priority and attention, but I still try to keep them, you know, within a reasonable amount of time. And I would pick from that, usually those are maybe one to two hour scenarios, depending on what they look like, but they're important enough that maybe we run them once a week on the latest, greatest build. We have mid, we have really mid sprints once a week, we have builds that are viable. Uh, so we can release once a week if we need to. Um, I will actually go through once we get a first couple of rounds of that bigger test to shift left and say, what are the top tables? What are the top methods? What are the top components from that scenario? And then come up with itty bitty tests that are atomizing the target scenario or the sneaker store scenario so that I get the, the indicated early warning that something that's part of that big scenario got changed. So, and that can just be hitting a query, you know, query a table with n number of rows, um, or it can be hitting a function or that and doing these small load tests. But I agree with you. If I don't have a customer, meaning a, a person who loves getting that performance number, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a database dev and I actually work on these main tables that were part of, you know, sneaker company X going, hating us. Uh, I am so worried this is in my top five things I watch all day long. And I'm like, if anyone checks anything in that touches that table or that component, I will make it a requirement to run a test and get you specifically as a stakeholder on the results for that test. But even those tests, the smallest ones I have run about 15 minutes. That's the 10, thre 10 J meter threads for 10, 10 transactions per second takes about 15 minutes, five minutes uh, to run five minutes steady state and then a, a little bit of time on either side. So if it's a 15 minute penalty at the smallest, the largest I have that are on a couple of these scenarios for check-in, I 
think it's an hour. It's like 45 minutes, but it takes an hour to reset after that because of how we have to set up and reset. So, but it's about an hour total, 45 minutes to, to get results back to the stakeholders uh, when I do that. And I'm, I have to say, I only have maybe, maybe five or six that are still on the pipeline and everything else, if I can push it, it's asynchronously running in the 24 hour continuous separate load test pipeline. Cool, great question. Any so, other questions? Mark, thank you so much for your time tonight. Of course. It's always so fun to get to see you and to get the benefit of all of your genius. So thank, thank you, you guys. for coming. And you have my contact information there. You can shoot me at the Perf Bites. Follow me on Twitter, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, but yeah. Send I got to go check out the Perf Bites and figure out the major performance fails of the month. That's the news of the damned. That's news the, of the damned. News of the damned. It's one of my fun. favorites. It's been very interesting during the uh, pandemic. I think he's on this weekend. Is uh, Then he goes on vacation for July. So, so yeah, the last one for a while will be this Sunday. Cool. Well, I'm going to stop this.